Hello and welcome to In Conversation, a Dub Lab podcast where each week we will bring you interviews from the Dub Lab Radio Archives. Well, my name is Elvin Estella. I go by DJ Nobody or Nobody on this station that we call DubLab.com. And on this beautiful Sunday afternoon, I am so uh, pleased to announce that we are interviewing Miss Linda Perhax. Hello, Linda. How are you? Hi, Elvin. I'm fine. And you? I'm doing really good. I'm really excited. Um, really happy to be uh, here with you today and meet you today. And um, of course, Linda Perhax, the creator of the album Parallelograms, which I'm sure many a Dub Lab listener have heard on this radio station, if not um, around the world. And Parallelograms was originally released in 1970, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was on the Cap Records label, which is a division of MCA and Universal. And um, Linda and I, right before we jumped on the air, we were just talking about um, you had no aspirations for this to even come back to this music once you had made it from the time in 1970, right? I think it'd probably be best to say I had no aspirations to be center stage performer but to share ideas with people either musically or through the work I do which is more of a healing work also that has always been central to me since I was a little child nice and so um, after this album was released in 1970 it says in the liner notes that you pretty much didn't want anything to do with, with the music business after that right um we poured our heart into making something of integrity and no hype. And the large company that had asked me to do the album did something at the very end that, to me, ruined it. Uh, they took the highs off and they took the lows off and pressed a vinyl that didn't have the sound that I had given them. And I asked if they would please uh, repress. I had no idea they'd send it way back to New York and do something without my understanding that would be so squished in sound. Mm -hmm. I, I was just not only heartbroken, but I was disgusted. Uh, it just sounded so bad to my ear. And I literally threw my vinyl away, and henceforth, for all the years that passed... I only played my own original tapes wow. that had the depth of sound. And if I made a tape to show somebody, I never showed them the vinyl. I showed them something taken off of my personal tapes because wow. it had the full dimension of sound. It was the way you imagined it and you, and you created it. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm still very sensitive as I start to do mu new music. I, I find that I, I'm a little more sensitive than they're used to for... I don't, I don't like equalizers. I don't like things that crimp the sound. I want it to have the full presence so that you really feel like the person's breathing on you almost and they're mm -hmm. right there with you. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm just, I have always been a little sensitive to losing that intimacy that you get when you have the full complement of sound. The full spectrum. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, I guess we should talk a little bit about this record. Um, first and foremost, it's one of my favorite records that have ever been made. Um, Thank you. Uh, I really hold it really special uh, to me. My wife loves it as well. It's just a record that uh, it just takes you to a place, you know, that not a lot of music takes you. And um, everyone laughs because I'm, I'm always asking people, you know, what sounds like parallelograms? I'm trying to find, you know, 10 records that sound like parallelograms, and I haven't been able to find not even one. There's a few that come really close, but uh, what really sets it apart is just the actual emotion that it evokes in me, you know, and I don't really find too much music like that. Well, again, because I wasn't thinking of being a professional artist, what I was really trying to connect with is the healing in the universe, the timelessness in the just staring out into the sky, uh, looking in the ocean, just the connection with the natural universe. Um, I was just trying to connect with that, and somehow I must have projected it into the songs adequately to take other people there, too. Um, all of this is a surprise to me, you have to understand. <laughs> um, I just did it naturally, because 
it seemed like the right way to convey the love. Yeah. I think that's what it is, is, is that it's so uninhibited yet not overthought that it just puts like some of the words, you know, uh, they just describe things like seeing silences between leaves that just describes so much by saying so little. And I think the whole album kind of gives, gives, uh, that feeling of just describing experiences perfectly. So yeah, you're right. It does uh, physically and mentally put you there. Well, also I was truly living it. Um, I lived on the Pacific Northwest. I lived in Mendocino, traveled up and down between Los Angeles, Topanga Canyon, and up through Big Sur, up into Mendocino, which is on the seacoast of Northern California. Pacific Northwest, I lived in a little area called Chimica. Oh, wow. And I spent every day on the beach, even if it was 70 mile, a, mile an hour winds, I was out there walking you know, and, and looking at, at all the beauty, um, it, it never was just an attempt to compose music. It was always an attempt to, to capture those moments that were very real. And that's why the albums kind of has this, uh, like observant perspective, oh yes. you know, it's just observing what's happening and but like I said, instead of it doesn't sound like you're describing what's happening. It actually sounds like you're there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's good. That's what it's meant to be. Great. So I guess we should talk about how the album was created, how it was birthed. Well, um, I, I guess the best explanation is to s just tell the truth. I was at USC on scholarship planning for a very practical bread and butter type career mm -hmm. one that would carry me through life without interfering with life and I very carefully chose a career where you could work one day a week or seven you could work five hours a day or 12 hours and it could be designed by you and it was also in the healing sciences which I feel very comfortable with so um I met an interesting person when I was at USC. It was a, a young artist, uh, product designer, toy designer, sculptor, painter, just magnificent talent. And he took me into the wilderness in places I'd never, never been before. I, I lived in Mill Valley and walked through the Redwood Country as a child, but this young man took me to really wild places where I could see wilderness for the first time. Like real nature. Oh, yeah. We didn't go to parks. <laughs> we went where it was so wild it was hard to get to. Oh, wow. And um, watching him do the things he had gone there for, which was he had a wild bird uh, collection uh, to, to uh, bring the birds back to UCLA where he lectured in the design department on, on aerodynamics. Um, I just began to write songs. There were so many hours spent out there, I just thought, well, poems, songs, and it, it just began to happen. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you say songs, were you uh, just writing the words out, or did you have the melodies in your head as well? Uh, or, you know, how, how was that? Um, at first it was poetry and just uh, lyrical. And then it merged into songs when I took my first guitar lesson. Wow. You have to understand, I... I, I have a musical gift, and I've had that since a child. But it just almost exploded on me from the minute I touched a guitar. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So. Okay. Um, and let's see. So that was around, uh, what year would you think would you say that was? <laughs> Is that 69 or 70? Around 69, right? Because the album was yes, out. Yes, yes. Okay. And... Um, the fellow that actually produced the record and urged you to actually start recording these uh, these songs into a full album, how did that come about? Well, my my straight job or or my daytime gig, day yeah, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> um, was as a dental hygienist, and I worked for a Beverly Hills periodontist, which is a gum specialist. And he had hired me um, as a student at USC. He said, as soon as you graduate, will you come and work for me? I had no idea he had a very swank office in Beverly Hills. High-profile patients from all over the world, royalty, consulate generals, very well-known entertainment people. 
So from day one, I was swimming in an atmosphere of very high-profile people. But I loved it. I loved especially the creative ones. So I would always ask the creative people, how's your project going? You know, how's Mm -hmm. that script? How's that piece of music you're writing? How's that last movie you were working on? And I had a general, a genuine interest in their answers. So Leonard Rosamond and his wife were patients of mine. And uh, I adored them both. And he was a composer for movie and TV. And he had so many assignments that needed to capture the essence of the hippie era, which was a very young culture of people doing things not fully explainable to (laughs) people 20 and 30 years older than they were. Mm -hmm. So he knew I lived in Topanga Canyon and that I was certainly the right age to understand all of that. So one day he said, I can't believe this is all you do. I said, no, I have a young husband. He's very creative. We travel a lot. And I write little songs. He said, can I hear them? He said, you live in Topanga, you write songs, and you're in your middle 20s. I need to hear these songs. (laughs) (laughs) So I gave him a little homemade tape, and he called me and woke me up the next morning, which was Saturday, and said, how soon can you get here? Those are beautiful. Wow. And then it started from there. Correct. Nice. And uh, one thing I really like about this new reissue that we've been talking about on Sunbeam Records is that it gives uh, full credit to the musicians that played on the record. And um, I've enjoyed this record for years now, and I never really knew you know, the musicians that were behind it. So uh, once again, Leonard Rosenman, he was the uh, producer. Yes. All right. And Steve Cohn was the lead guitarist. Yes. Steve was a young man, and like me, totally unknown. He has gone on to be a fine composer and does some very advanced works now. He injured his little finger. He doesn't play guitar anymore. He composes it in his mind and and conducts other people playing. Okay. And how did the band come about? Was that something that uh, Leonard arranged himself? No. Um, He put Steve Cohen and I together to, um, in private, uh, I would teach Steve each little note of, say, like a song, Chimicum Rain. My guitar ability was fairly limited. I was still a student at it. I could compose what was needed, the spaces, the silences, the vocals that would go with it, but I never could play it perfectly. So I had to teach Steve each little note, and I always asked him, please don't overplay it. We need this to be as delicate as something Japanese. Yeah. Oh, that explains why there's so much restraint on so much of the music. Yes. Wow, that's great. And, uh, okay, so it seems like Steve Cohn and you kind of developed the core of the arrangements for the songs, right? And then the band would... Uh, yes, we would go into a session and other musicians might be called in, but by the time Steve and I walked in, we'd have a take before two, three hours were up. Wow. Uh, the voc- the lead vocals were done on no more than take one, take two, th- take three. There was no more. Wow. So work. all of these songs are captured pretty uh, soon the, after they're discovered by the other musicians. Yes. Wow, that's really nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it was back then. That was, those were the magic takes, right? I didn't know any different. <laughs> nice. I, I was the, 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 the one who knew very little about all this. I, I walked in pretty innocent to the whole thing. And uh, let's see, I guess we should just take a listen to the first song on this record. It's called Chimicum Rain, and maybe a little background story about it. You said you actually lived yes. at Chimicum? Mm-hmm. While I was still married, um, we built a home in a beautiful place on the Olympic Peninsula that could see Seattle and the Cascade Mountains, but the Olympic Peninsula is closer is further west and is closer to the Pacific Ocean. And it's very wild and very beautiful and very rainy. And there's a little place named Chimicum, which is, of course, an Indian word, a beautiful Indian word. And we lived in Chimicum. Wow. And so this song is about that. Mm -hmm. And it's the first song on this album, once again, Parallelograms. And uh, my friend uh, Guillermo Scott Heron is, uh, is the person who played me this record all the way back in 2003. And, um... I just have to say, for a first song on a record, like, this is the song that'll hook you in. By the 10th second, I was like, I'm sold. 
So here we are. This is uh, Chimicum Rain from Parallelograms, here with Miss Linda Perhex on dublab.com. And we're back here on dublab.com. Uh, DJ Nobody here with you, and we are very pleased to be with Linda Perhax. We just took a listen to the very wonderful Chimicum Rain on her Parallelograms album, currently being reissued on the Sunbeam Records label, and it's also finally available on double vinyl as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the double vinyl has got all the bonus tracks that weren't on the original album, and you were just telling us earlier that there is a song that's actually included that wasn't on the original album and is the first time that anything that wasn't on the album is available, right? Yes, yes. And that one's called I Would Rather Love. And uh, that was the other thing is when the uh, last reissue came out, I couldn't believe that there wasn't, you know, one uh, unknown song. And I'm like, man, it's... Well, actually, um, it, let me let me go back a little ways and... The reissue that came out around, I don't know, 2002, 2003. That was the first one I'd heard. Uh, that had If You Were My Man. That one was not on the original oh, album. Oh, okay. That was not on the vinyl. That was a, a bonus. Yes. Okay. That was hidden in my bedroom for years. Wow. And the song that on this new reissue, I Would Rather Love, same story. It was hidden in my bedroom all these years. Oh, okay. I just brought it out for the first time in the year 2008. So I must have assumed that that song was on the original album just because I'd heard it so much, but didn't make the uh, no. connection. Wow, that's amazing. So this is the brand new reissue of this album, and it's um, it's cleaned up, right? It's mastered off of your uh, your tapes. Yes. The ones that you it's, would listen it's to. It's my masters, yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this mm -hmm. is... Uh, Definitely this, the way this album is supposed to be heard. Yes, it has the full complement of sound. It hasn't been crimped. No highs, no lows taken off of it. All right, there you go. So, um, of course, all of us here on the station are huge fans, but I highly recommend this this album to anyone who doesn't know it. And uh, now that there's the definite version out, you should definitely pick it up. So I guess we left off um, the creation of the record, uh, the creation of Chimicum Rain, how are some of the lyrics, um, I guess I want to just find out, you know, we are obviously, you know, your inspiration is like nature and, but how, how did they come to you? Or was there a heavy editing process or would you just kind of write stream of consciousness and let it be or stream of consciousness. And then I would go back and distill it. But the initial writing would always be without any concern for spelling, grammar, sentence structure, just to capture uh, feeling. Okay. And then I would go back with a red uh, marker and underline the haiku phrases, the, to the, the essence, just the hot spots that would capture the whole feeling. Of the, of the piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you distill something from like three pages down to one page, down to half a page, using that method, you will have lyrics when you finish, you will have a good set of lyrics wow. if you do that. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a good formula that I can mm -hmm. uh, start mm -hmm. incorporating into my It works for everybody. Try okay. it. <laughs> All right. And um, I guess the next song I kind of want to talk about, or uh, th it's actually the name of the album, but where does that come from, Parallelograms? Thank you for asking. Um, when I was taking so many science courses and biology courses, I was fascinated with all the crazy Latin derivatives where they would string words together like little trains with boxcars on them, you know. And these little words would dance in my head at night after all that studying, you know. And I kind of liked them. They were sort of playful. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that the true meaning of the word parallelograms, that there's a galaxy in the shape of a parallelogram. I learned that just a few years ago. And that the parallelogram shape is very similar to the DNA molecule. Oh, wow. It's a helix. It's a, it's a spiraled, almost helix. I didn't know that. I just liked the word. And I liked the danciness of it. And I liked all the little syllables the that were... The euphony of it? Yeah. I just liked, liked the idea. Mm -hmm. I had no idea there was a deeper significance. But... Uh, I was playing with a word and playing with a Celtic 
um, melody on a 12-string guitar in my kitchen at night in Topanga Canyon. And I kind of like the little Celtic sound. And uh, in all honesty, I was driving the Ventura Freeway, and I looked up, and I saw... Um, it looked almost like a, an aurora borealis. It was a beautiful, beautiful vision with me driving after being over at Leonard Rosamond's house. He and his or he and his wife were showing me music all day. I was just infused with music, mm-hmm. and it was maybe one o'clock at night. Only coffee in me, I promise you. Very tired, <laughs> and I, I'm on the Ventura Freeway trying to get back to Topanga Canyon, and all of a sudden I saw like just a gorgeous visionary light thing in the sky. I couldn't believe the beauty. I pulled over to the side of the road and tried to scribble and draw what I'd seen. I knew I was seeing something in physics. I knew I was seeing wavelength, wavelength of both color and sound wave. I knew I was seeing them interpolate with one another. I knew I was seeing changes in form like a thought pattern. Uh, sort of like what happens when you're thinking a thought powerfully and you're sending out a different field energy by virtue of the the, the vibrance of your thought. But this was in the sky. <laughs> and I looked at that. I drew the picture as fast as I could. I came back wondering, what in the world was that? I thought I was maybe a little crazy. I showed Leonard the Celtic melody that I was creating I sang the words parallelograms on top of that dancey little melody, and I said, Leonard, I need to create a three-dimensional piece of music that's like sculpting ice, where you know where you're going, you know what you're creating. It's totally three-dimensional, and it's visual with depth. And he looked at me and he said, I like it. He said, that's real composition. That's a very original concept, Linda. We need to do this. And when we we were recording it, it was such an unusual thing that we were trying to do. If anybody came into the recording room with a dark suit on and looked like an executive, he would say, jump to the other songs, Linda, because they will never understand this. (laughs) And yet that song is what carried the album all these years. It became the most famous one in terms of its originality, I guess. And that is the one that I feel saved the whole thing for all these years. I mean, on on an album that's already, like I said, singular, I don't really find, I haven't found an album like it. That one song is like nothing else on the record. And uh, the way you say it is really how it is. It's like an audio painting where, you know, the colors just kind of fill in and then, but at the same time, the whole piece was the picture, like as you were painting it. Yes. And I'd like to add something here. I know that many times people think, well, someone took something to alter their mind. So I would like to uh, make a, an important comment here. Even as a five-year-old and a six-year-old and a seven-year-old, I was creating complex choreography and melodies and lyrics showed them to my teachers, insisted that my little classmates help me do them, and um, was reprimanded for interfering with the uh, the curriculum. But the original spirit in in my whole being was creating complex, three-dimensional form music, even as a tiny child. In addition, I also would see choreography at night in little... I, I can't describe it, but I would always fall asleep at night seeing choreography in, like, little digital figures. And I just knew where to place dancers and, and things because I would see it every night till I fell asleep. And in addition to that, I have seen field energy around people and thought patterns where somebody's thinking something, even in my healing work. In the room where I'm trying to take care of a patient, I might see a thought pattern that the patient has no idea what I'm seeing. So this sensitivity to to wavelengths, whether they are musical wavelengths, color wavelengths, all those things that anybody's capable of seeing, somehow I was sensitive enough to be seeing both that and the physical plane reality and begin to understand where where it all comes together. Wow. Is it? 
something to do with synesthesia, maybe, where you can Synesthe- hear the... Synesthesia is a man-made word, and I'd like to be very careful with it because many of the people that w- use that word don't know what they're talking about. When you see a thought pattern emanating from somebody, you're seeing the wavelengths that they have created by the vibrance and the intensity and the focus of their thoughts, which is electromagnetic energy transmitted by their brain. That can create one type of pattern. There's another type of pattern you might see. It might be a spiritual experience where you're seeing something very high and very... um, very pure. There's another kind you could see that's coming from the opposite end of the universe, and it could be quite scary and very dangerous. The main thing to understand is that these wavelengths are everywhere. Uh, Dogs hear sound wavelengths that we don't hear easily. Um, That's an example of their, their capacity to hear, which exceeds ours. Some people are very sensitive. They are working off of these wavelengths um, simultaneous to the average person. Mm-hmm. It's like the idea that uh, no thought or no matter really dies. It's always around. It's just about being sensitive to tap into that. We are all capable of tapping mm-hmm. into it. Absolutely. It's, it's part of our being, but perhaps we don't work on it enough. Or It's like our cell phones. If you're in trouble, you grab the cell phone and call somebody who will come and rescue you. I would really like to be sensitive to the needs of all human beings right now on our earth. None of us are protected from catastrophe at this point. We have some pretty violent and amazing things happening in our world, cataclysmic in many ways, financially very disturbing in many ways. If you're in trouble and the cell phone doesn't work and the media doesn't work and the email doesn't work, what's left to use to call out for help? It would really be a good idea for more and more of us to understand these high frequency, very real energy levels that we can tap into to just send out a 911 into the universe and I promise you, you will get an answer and you will get help. I think this is the perfect way to uh, segue into the next song, which is Parallelograms, the title track from Linda Perhax's album from 1970, the focus of our conversation and uh, one of my favorite albums to ever be released into the earth. And here it is, Parallelograms on dublab.com. We are back here on dublab.com. DJ Nobody here with you with Linda Perhax. Just took a listen to her very wonderful parallelograms off of the album of the same name from 1970, discussing the reissue, um, how some of the songs were written, the inspirations, and just the general uh, beginnings of Linda as a songwriter and artist. And uh, Linda was actually really nice enough to let Frosty and I listen to a new song called Inside the Storm, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very, very wonderful piece. I think people who, uh, who love your uh, Parallelograms album, the most obvious um, thing that's changed is there's more of an electronic texture to the music, right? Mm-hmm. And you were telling us there was a specific reason or there's a reason why you would rather... Uh, work with that new modern technology than, say, just the acoustic guitar? Well, I'd like to use both, but I don't want to be just restricted to straight acoustic. Even as a child, and certainly as I began to grow spiritually and meditate more, etc., I I just have a sense that sounds and tones can go as far as light in the universe, and I always want to go out and find out where they went and what they sound like. So it's natural for me to want to use synthesizers and experiment with with uh, tones and dimensions that we've never been able to use before. Mm-hmm. I also love acoustic because it is so organic. So when I use the synthesizer, I keep the song still very organic, very 
very much, very mindful of natural energies. Okay. And is Inside the Storm, uh, I guess, talk about that. Is it is it the beginnings of an album? Is it one song as part of a... Um, it's one song that I'm very happy with. We have some incredible visuals to use. It's almost like a dolly out there moving in space, and uh, meaning the, the painter, dolly. Okay. <laughs> and... Um, and the piece of music uses, well, it's just very contemporary. It's a very now piece of music. Very modern. Very now. But your yeah. voice still sounds, uh, you know, just as sweet as it did back then. You can definitely tell it's you. I even smiled during the middle section where it kind of cuts away. I was like, wow, you know, that's Linda Perhacks right there. <laughs> great, great. And uh, the visuals that you showed us, explain a bit more about it. There's actually like a, a concept behind the two it was two earths right kind of yes i think i'll save that for when the whole song is fully ready to okay. show and i'll come back and and we'll do a whole thing together okay. then how would that be that'd be perfect uh, but, that way don't spoil no surprises yeah but what i'm trying to do is um use some multimedia techniques where i'll be able to do visual music i'll have the visual plus the music and um i hope very much that ryan hefferton Hef- is Heffington, I'm sure, Huffington. Huffington, who's a magnificent dancer, um, I w- would very much like him to participate and be be out there in the front doing some majestic dances and and the visuals in back and and this music. It it should be very multi textured. Do you think that you know as an uh, as an artist in a who was you know, back then during the uh, initial revolution of music and culture and stuff and seeing it now, um, do you think that's an important way for music to continue to persevere is to have kind of a multimedia um, aspect to it? Because it seems important to you for this new stuff to kind of have a visual element to go with with the sonic, right? Well, since I was doing that as a child too, it's kind of natural to me to, to blend all of that and because I've seen visuals around people even as they're talking at times to me and they don't know what I'm seeing, you know, that would be a natural way for me to express creatively because I'm used to seeing these things. But I'd also like to say that the 70s were so free. I don't remember the word licensing in the 70s. I think the first time I heard the word licensing was in the year 2000, 2001, 2003. Mm -hmm. The freedom and the love and the sharing that we enjoyed in the 70s, I believe the way that, that, that this will come back and give the artists this type of freedom again will be through the Internet, and it will be done your way, yeah, your generation's way. I mean, this is really the first time in history uh, that, you know, someone without any economic means can create something in their bedroom and then put it on to a device where millions of people could see it within in, a day. In the 70s and 60s, I don't think any of us had the aspiration to become rich off of what we were doing. What we were sharing was love. Um, friendship and depth of love between the people, unparalleled. I, I don't know if I've experienced it since. And it's because it was so naked. Uh, I mean that emotionally. Um, so honest and so genuine, and it was very deep. And um, the only way you can create, the only way any era can have creators that are really doing truthfully what's coming through the energy and the spirit in their own souls is when there is not so much restraint. When money became too important, then hits became so important that it constricted the creativity. It's the internet where you're going to find the young people unrestrained and producing some of the beauty from their spirits that we've been all wishing we could taste again. And that's why you go backwards into the 70s. It truly was happening then. Yeah. We were talking about that at the start of the interview, how, uh, you know, we're, we're collectively this generation, and I speak for people probably um, in their later 30s um, up until teens they're all obsessed with that time period uh 1965 to 19 you know 80 it's the spirit or but more specifically like we were talking about was that you know 66 towards 72 because Mm -hmm. um i guess what you're saying where you know people are a collective and i guess what we 
really are trying to get at is that you can tell that all the creative people in that span of time were reflecting one consciousness as as opposed to now where there's everyone is so fragmented, you know? Yes. Um, there are some distasteful things that have come out. People say it's okay because it reflects our era. Believe me, when you work through the Internet and you have the freedom to just say it like you feel it, I, I can't wait to hear all that you're capable of doing. That's all I can say. Great. I think that's the way we should end it. You can't end it on, on a better note, I don't think. So thank you once again for uh, visiting us here at Dub Lab. It was really enjoyable. It was a pleasure to meet you. And um, I'm really, really excited that Parallelograms has been released the way you intended it uh, to be heard because um, I just think it's an album of really great depth and importance, especially that it came from uh, California, where I'm from, and uh, it still kind of remains uh, a hidden gem. But it's definitely an album that I think can just go for forever and ever. Thank, Thank you for you. giving it to us. Thank you, Ellen. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks, Mark, for setting this up. And thanks to Dub Lab for setting this up. I must say it was a very uh, enjoyable day. And uh, it's the day after Valentine's Day. And a woman told us yesterday that yesterday was the official dawning of the Age of Aquarius. Wow. Wow. There you go. <laughs> In Conversation was produced by Dub Lab, a nonprofit radio station broadcasting live from Los Angeles since 1999. Sound editing and theme song by Matea Bame. For more programming, visit dublab.com. And thank you for listening.